welcome to number 27. I'm Jack and today I'm going to be talking to you about one of Japan's most underrated cars. The Mitsubishi 3000 GT or GTO. Now in the 1990s Mitsubishi decided they wanted to make something truly special. And I remember reading Autocar back when I was still a teenager and there was the sort of scoop section or whatever, the upcoming section, and they were talking about Mitsubishi producing this car. And I, there was a sense of disbelief, both from me, but actually I think also from the journalist who was writing that, about whether they were gonna pull it off, because this car was gonna have not one, but two turbos. It's gonna have a V6 engine. It was gonna have four wheel drive. It was gonna have four wheel steer. It was gonna have active aero it was gonna have electronically switchable suspension and it was gonna have electronically switchable exhaust. And I, let me tell you, at the time, that was just absolutely unheard of. Some of those things were present in some cars, but there was no other car that approached it in terms of like tech overkill. This was just something completely on a different scale and a different level. over here uh, I think the consensus seemed to be that it certainly wasn't a bad car um, but I think there was a lot of expectation from it and it kind of failed to deliver and I think the biggest criticism was that there was a lot of technology and that didn't seem to translate into making it a really good drive uh, part of the issue uh, I'm pretty sure was the weight um, it weighs 1,780 kilos, so almost 1,800 kilos really, or 3,800 pounds for our American friends. And that is huge. I mean, it's, it's only just shy of my W220S class. I mean, it is, it's a heavy thing. I guess all that technology plays a part in that, um, but still, uh, it is pretty, it is pretty incredible really. Also notable that in America, Dodge had the Stealth, which was essentially a rebodied GTO. Um, so gearbox, we'll talk about the driving later. The gearbox, I'm, I, I think we'll need a bit of getting used to, but so the Dodge Stealth was essentially a rebodied one of these, and that was produced for, I think, four or five years, but mechanically it was pretty much identical. There were some various different variations across different markets. Uh, there was, a, I think, a front drive version in Japan, maybe a rear wheel drive only version in the States. Um, but this is the full fat, electronic everything, four wheel steer, four wheel drive, active aero. And it is, you know, it is a technical tour de force. Now, Dev, who owns this car, nice young lad, and I asked him why he got it or how he came to get it. And unbelievably, he was, he was originally looking for a hybrid Yaris. Um, but then for some reason, he went and test drove this or had a look at one of these. And like so many JDM legends, he'd always wanted one because he played Gran Turismo on the PlayStation. And apparently these were cars that at least on Gran Turismo, possibly in real life, you could really easily get up to massive horsepower figures. So he'd always wanted one. Now there were a couple of facelifts throughout its life. This is a phase two car, so it doesn't have the pop-up headlights, which actually I miss, but this looks quite cool in a sort of techy Japanese way with those lights. Um, it does have a six speed box, which is actually quite handy. Uh, and a few other minor revisions really, but um, on the whole, very similar to the phase one. There was a phase three that was only, I don't think that came out in Europe. That was only in the States and in Japan. And that actually did away with some of the cool tech. So the active aero, I think, was taken away, the active suspension or the switchable suspension, but it had a more aggressive body kit. And actually, I do think they do look good, the phase threes. So the Mitsubishi V6 was used in some of their other cars. In this one, with the twin turbos, it develops 280 horsepower. Uh, however, the car's weight blunts the performance a little bit, but it is fast. 
out on an open road like this, it actually starts to make a lot more sense. On that little tight and windy one, the suspension wasn't quite working as well as you would like in the sense that it was, it was feeling a bit jiggly and so on. <laughs> Now this particular car has had coilovers put on, but the consensus from owners is that really you you get once once the original suspension wears, first of all you can't replace it because you just can't buy it. And secondly, if you get a good set of coilovers, the car rides as well as it does on the soft setting, but handles as if it was on the hard setting, turns in as well and doesn't lean. So coilovers are a good thing. But yeah, as soon as the road opens up like this, the turns are a bit gentler, I can already feel it working much better. It's a big car, and on the tighter roads, it isn't quite as at home as you would, uh, as you'd want, I guess. But on a road like this, it's already miles better. So just did a nice little tight corner there, and um, It's surprisingly good. Um, so when you're driving around normally, it feels a bit jiggly. It doesn't quite seem to, doesn't quite seem to work, but uh, it had a bit of an R32 feel just there uh, in the sense that, yeah, it feels nice. So the engine basically seems to have power pretty much everywhere. It keeps on pulling until seven, but there isn't really any point in revving it quite that high. It does sound, it sounds nice, I think, for a turbo engine. It doesn't sound amazing, but as we said, there's a turbo engine, you can feel the little whistle as the second turbo spools in. Um, there's not really much lag, especially for an early turbo of this time. So I think they were really successful in that. So if you pick up the pace a bit, going a bit faster at these higher speeds, just then it felt a little bit like the front might have gone a bit light, but it could have been because of the undulation. I don't think you can quite get away from the weight. It's better than I thought, but I think it's just finding it hard to control all that weight when you start to go a bit quicker. I love these. I don't know why at the time they hated them and they said that they were too plasticky. The, the quality of the plastics is good. I like the layout. This has sort of echoes of Datsun Z about it. Quite a nice interior. So I want to gather my thoughts, so I've just pulled over, and basically, it's a really interesting car, this, and to me, I found it sort of behave differently in different circumstances. So on really tight corners, it completely belies its weight, and I think that's where the four-wheel steering really comes into its own, and it sort of makes it feel like a more agile car, and actually, it's got a bit of an R32 feeling about it, where it kind of starts to push out, but really benignly on both sides, and it feels really nice. And then that kind of gets you quite excited about the higher speed stuff. But on the higher speed stuff, to me at least, it feels like it behaves slightly differently. Not badly, but just a bit differently. It's not quite as much fun. So this isn't the ideal road to test this car, to be honest, because it's really bumpy. There's loads of undulations. So it absolutely makes the, makes the weight, uh, it brings the weight into relief. You know, it brings it into the fore, the, the problem that it is quite a porky car. Um, but... Um, the gearbox that I was talking about, I actually got used to it and you just have to find where third gear is. It's not quite instinctive, but it's fine. It's very close to first gear, but it's nice and short and stubby. Um, and it very much feels like one of those lovely JDM, JDM products from the 90s. I mean, I really like it in terms of, you know, if you're a scratcher and you want a car for driving hard, then for me, an R32 is definitely going to give you more back than this. On the other hand, this is definitely something that you could probably tour in quite easily, and it's just a, a very different sort of car. Why is it that it hasn't had the sort of success of the other cars have? Well, I think partly it is that maybe it's not the sharpest car to drive, but I think there's also some other factors. And the first is that in the US, this was a car that was imported. All the others, the R32s, all that kind of stuff, was never officially imported. And it gave it, although it was in the, in the various PlayStation games and so on, it gave them a cachet, you know, for the US market. And some of them weren't imported to the UK either. 
Um, so that's one thing. I think also there was so much expectation because of the amount of technology that was being squeezed to it. And don't forget at the time, Japanese, Japan was on a complete roll. Not just in terms of their cars, but economically, it looked like the Japanese could do anything. So when this came out with all this technology packed into it, it had to be amazing. And it turned out to be a good car, but maybe not quite as special feeling or not. It wasn't the way that the testers had envisaged at the time. Whatever you think about the way that these drive, I think that it should be held in high esteem simply because it was the car that introduced all the technology that we take for granted 30 years later. It really was a technical tour de force and unbelievable that they managed to come out with this in the 1990s. You have to remember at that time, there was, that was when we had like Vauxhall Cavaliers. You know, injection was quite a fancy and advanced thing at that time. And they come out with something with four wheel steer, four wheel drive, twin turbos, active aero, active suspension and active exhaust. It was unheard of. Um, anyway, thank you so much to Dev for letting me drive this today. Um, th this is his sort of pride and joy. He's had it resprayed. It's a really nice example. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, it didn't have the active suspension because he's changed it to coilovers. But apparently they're better like this. So fair enough. Please do subscribe if you haven't. And if you have an interesting car, please do get in touch with me. Instagram is the best way. And um, yeah, and really look forward to seeing you for the next one.